Uh, I actually want to talk about something very, very different from animals. Um, it's a, a really kind of a new endeavor for me. Um, it's a different way of thinking about morality, something that's in the news every day. Uh, and I want to share some of the thoughts and hopefully uh, challenge you a little bit. What I want to do is tell you about how science can begin to penetrate age-old questions that have long been the privileged domain of moral philosophy, and how I think they begin to overturn some of the ways we've thought about our moral judgments. The classic ways of thinking about um, how our moral judgments come to be and how they play a role is to distinguish three types of ways of thinking about a moral evaluation. On the one hand, we can simply describe what people do when they say that this is right or this is wrong. Given those descriptive aspects, we can then say, well, okay, we have this view, but is this what we ought to do? So we raise from a descriptive level of analysis to a prescriptive. What ought we to do in certain situations? And then having sort of characterized that prescriptive level, we can then ask about the terms. Well, what does it mean to have a right for something to be wrong? We analyze the concepts, the ideas that float around in the moral space. So the two traditional views about our sources of judgment go way, way back in time. The first I'll characterize um, as the following. It dates back at least as far as David Hume. Um, it's that when we deliver a moral judgment, we do so involuntarily, unconsciously. And what drives the moral judgment of something being right or wrong is our emotions. Our emotions give us the inspiration. It's the source of our decisions about right and wrong. The opposing view, um, which many philosophers support, uh, which the law supports, which government supports, is that the way you come to a moral decision is that you consciously reason through the principles. Based on an analysis of those principles, you derive a moral judgment. So it's very deliberate, it's rational, it's logical, it's principle-based. That view can be ascribed to someone like Immanuel Kant in sort of moral psychology and moral development. Uh, the late Larry Kohlberg was one who pushed that view very strongly in terms of thinking about the stages of moral development. That you become a morally mature individual when you can justify the reasons for doing something based on principles that make sense given the law or given sort of rational ways of thinking about things. The view that I want to do sort of undercuts, in some sense, the emotional view and says that underlying our emotion is a calculus of decision for moral judgments. It's going to go back to the first talk about a grammar of morality. In this case, what I want to do is appeal to the logic that Noam Chomsky and other linguists following that tradition have used to think about the nature of our language capacity. I want to make a very close analogy that the ways in which language works, our language faculty, is very much the same as the way our moral faculty works. When we are confronted with a moral dilemma, a moral conflict, we immediately, involuntarily, unconsciously, rapidly come up with a judgment, but it's based on principles that we simply can't access. They're there, they operate, they operate quickly, but we can't penetrate them, but they drive our judgments. And the person who's most responsible for this view is the late John Rawls, the political philosopher who wrote a very important book in the 70s called The Theory of Justice. Rawls said we should think carefully about the relationship between how we come to a grammaticality judgment and how we come to an ethicality judgment, whether something is right or wrong. So here is one way to think about that analogy. If morality works in very much the same kind of ways as language works, then here's what follows. Moral judgments will be delivered rapidly with no reflection and no conscious access to the underlying principles. So you're confronted with something, quickly you derive a judgment about a right or wrong, but you can't actually derive why you thought it was the correct answer or not. Secondly, some judgments will be actually the same across culture. You'll find some aspects that will be universal. What culture can do is play around with those judgments within a small range of variation in the same way that culture plays around with variation in languages. There is a universal component shared within our species. Third, the judgments that people make will be based on the causes and consequences of action. So the principles, the underlying grammar is going to take certain aspects of the action, why it was caused and what it consequences are and derive something like a judgment about a permissible, obligatory, or forbidden action. If this view is right, then our moral judgments precede our emotions. Emotions follow from the judgments we've made 
based on unconscious processes. And therefore, what emotions may do is affect what we do as opposed to how we judge a situation. How do you go about applying science to this view? Well, here's what we did a couple of years ago. We put up a website called the Moral Sense Test. Within a very short period of time, we had a large number of people logging in, giving us information about who they were, where they were from, religious background, age, education, and so forth, and then proceeding to answer a suite of moral dilemmas. Our current sample size is about 100,000 subjects from 120 different countries, uh, age range between 13 and 70. Let me give you a classic moral dilemma, one that's kind of well known in moral philosophy. So this was a dilemma that was developed by Philip of Foot, the moral philosopher, and has been played around with by a lot of people with different permutations. A trolley is moving down a track when the conductor notices five hikers on the track ahead. He slams on the brakes, but they fail. The conductor passes out, unconscious. If the trolley continues along the track, it will kill five people.